Hey there, Philip here from Manning the Fort. Today, I want to show you how I made this kill team of Screaming Fanatics, who I intend to use in place of this team of Screaming Fanatics. I hadn't initially intended to make a video about the kit bash of this team itself, but y'all said you wanted to see it, so here we are. It's always been important to have a general final look in mind when kit bashing, but the modern kits make that even more important. If you're using a lot of running or leaping torsos and legs, you're going to want to have arms that look like they're moving in a believable way alongside that. Part of the plan also comes down to storytelling. If you're altering the way your models look, odds are it's because you want them to portray something special on the table. Let's talk about how I approached my story and plan for this kill team. I started getting rough ideas for a plan as soon as I saw the Adeptus Sororitas Novitiates rules in Kill Team Chalnath. I love the amount of flavor that each specialist has, and I tend to like teams that involve a lot of synergy. Artisanal teams, copyright glass half dead, like the Novitiates are all about synergy. What I was not crazy about were the models themselves. The Wimples, yes, that's the name of those cloth head coverings, just weren't doing it for me. Then I remembered I had picked up a box of Cawdor Redemptionists from the Necromunda range earlier this year. Crazy Religious Zealots? Check. Inferno? Big check. Yeah, they also have silly hats, but these hats are on fire. It's simultaneously awesome and hilariously over the top, just like 40k should be. My story for them was further inspired by the Siege of Terra novel Warhawk. In that book, Euphrates Keeler, the first imperial saint, leads a group of religious zealots into battle. They die in droves and carry the skulls of the fallen, and genuinely don't seem to care if they lived, so long as they serve the will of the god emperor. They read like a proto-version of what would eventually become the screaming fanatics that are the ecclesiarchy in 40k. Now that I have my rough idea, it's time to get my kits together to make it come to life on the table. To make the most out of your kits, and to decide which ones you'll need in the first place, you need to know what's in them. It used to be that the Games Workshop website was a great place to look at pictures of the sprues for any given kit, but that's less consistent these days. Still, there are other ways to look at the sprues for kits that aren't featured on the Games Workshop website, like the Redemptionists eBay listings will often have pictures of the sprues, though your mileage may vary on image quality. Also, instructions for kits are often posted online in places like the Warhammer Instructions subreddit. Those instructions will have pictures of what comes in the kit and some close-ups of particular bits. If you're not a regular Redditor, though, I don't recommend straying far from there. In the case of my Cawdor Redemptionists from Necromunda, I knew that in addition to the fiery aesthetic, the box comes with two flamers. They're called fire pikes in Necromunda, but they'll definitely do as stand-ins for flamers. There's also an eviscerator, that huge two-handed chainsword that I'll need for my penitent. I can also see that there are lots of other bits to make the other specialists for a religious zealot team, like books and things. Though the Redemptionist kit has a lot going for it, I knew I was going to need to add something else to get the kind of numbers I needed for a full kill team. I decided to add a second box of Redemptionists and a box of regular Cawdor Gangers. In case you haven't seen my previous kit bash video on making Primaris Neophytes slash Scouts, I'm a big fan of using the Necromunda range. The boxes are relatively inexpensive compared to 40k kits, and they come with a lot of bits that fit seamlessly into the grimdark aesthetic, since they're meant for a game set in the underbelly of a hive world. Where they do not always fit seamlessly, however, is onto models from other kits, or even the quote-unquote wrong bodies from within the same box. While individual poses are dynamic and interesting, it's very easy for them to start looking samey without some modification. If you don't have a deep bits box, though, a couple of kits like this is a really good place to start. As a longtime Space Marine player, I have a glut of chainswords, so I grabbed a few of those for suitably nasty-looking close combat weapons to stand in for novitiate blades. I also had been looking for an excuse to buy a Battle Sisters box for all of its tasty religious paraphernalia. Plus, they can make a kill team all on their own. Finally, I had a spare Cleona Zeitengale from Warhammer Quest Curse City that I've always thought would make a fun base model for a 40k character. It's worth noting that all of the bits I'm using, despite being from across multiple ranges, are Games Workshop plastic. Everything I'm making here would be legal at Warhammer World itself. Now, I've got the kits and bits I want, so I gather it all up and get my tools out. 
My kit bashing essentials are some nippers. I have both a good set and an older set that I don't mind chewing up on tougher materials with. A hobby knife with a fresh, sharp blade, files, glue, and sandpaper. Small files like this are fairly easy to find, and for sandpaper, I like to have an assortment of grits between 300 and 800. You can often find these fine grits in the hardware store in variety packs or on Amazon. On occasion, I will also sometimes use a jeweler's saw, but I won't need one as we're not doing any cutting that serious today. There are Amazon affiliate links to the exact tools that I personally use in the description below if you're interested, and if you buy from there, then a little bit of that comes back to the channel. Before I use any of that, however, there is one of the most important pieces of a kit basher's toolbox, poster putty. Now, depending on where you live, it may be called blue tack, poster tack, sticky tack, or something else. Basically, it's just a sticky putty that's designed to be reused, and it's an absolute must if you don't want to end up wasting a lot of extra time and money on bits. Now that I've got a general plan and all my supplies together, it's time to get to work. For the majority of this team, I'm going to be doing fairly simple things like head and arm swaps, but even that involves a little more work than it used to, like I was saying earlier. When looking at the main bodies I'm going to use, I try to pay attention to which arm and shoulder combinations have flat edges, because those are going to be the easiest. Also, while I absolutely love Necromunda kits for their take on the 40k aesthetic, one area they provide a little bit of an extra challenge is in the mix of their poses. A Necromunda box tends to include two identical sprues with some options built in to vary up those sets of identical poses. In the case of the Redemptionist, knowing my kit means that I'm aware that I have four sets of the same three torso and leg combinations. I'll need to be mindful of not letting them get too samey as I'm working. On the flip side, the Redemptionist and Cawdor boxes both come with cowls that tend to cover the upper arms. Bits like this are great because they mean you don't have to be 100% precise on your arm joints since nobody's ever going to see them. The same is absolutely true for things like Space Marine shoulder pads. The simplest way to attack these while keeping the variety I'm looking for is to file down the upper torsos so that the cows fit over the top, then just trim down the arm and shoulder joints so the arms will simply slide underneath. This is where dry fitting with poster putty becomes invaluable. I can play around with different looks and see where multi-piece joins, like for two-handed weapons, are going to line up. Then I can trim some more, dry fit again, and rinse and repeat until it looks how I want. I mostly do the same thing with head swaps. Some neck joints are concave and some are convex, but with a little trial and error, I'm able to get looks I'm happy with. Even weapons can be separated from hands of other kits with relative ease. Things like chainswords are nice for this, since with careful cutting, the hand can be removed while leaving the basket hilt intact, making it easier to go on top of a different hand. Again, use the kit and any associated bits that will hide messy joints to your advantage in this stage. Later on, if and when you feel more confident with things like epoxy putty, you can get fancy. For now, we just want a somewhat unique looking force to put on the table. Remember though, unlike what I say at the end of my painting guides, this isn't just paint. Use the old carpenter's adage, measure twice, cut once. If you trim too little, it's very easy to take more off. But if you trim a piece too much, you're going to need to break out the green stuff to try to fix it. If you're careful and willing to start slow, even someone who's never tried kit bashing before can get a good handle on this in just a couple of hours, and you only get faster after that. Now once you get a decent handle on the basics, feel free to get more adventurous. There are a few models here that I added some extra things to beyond the head, arm, and weapon swaps. There are a few bits I identified early that I knew I wanted to make special use of. First off, there is tons of fiery bits in the Redemptionist kit, and these seem like the type of people that would enjoy a good heretic roasting. Just like with the arms and shoulders, I size up parts of the weapons where my carefully removed flamey bits will fit and attach, like on this preceptor. In the rules, the preceptor has a two-handed mace that sets people on fire. Well, I don't see any reason why that can't be a two-handed axe that sets people on fire. The original axe bit even has a little pilot light on the top and a visible fuel tank on the back, so it looks pretty natural. Once I really got into the zone, I did kind of go a little nuts on these. This model represents the Pronator, who has a special rule about revealing a relic mid-game to give nearby teammates a boost. 
I swiped this sweet little reliquary chest from the Battle Sisters kit, stole, or maybe looted, a targeting reticule from an orc commando, then used that as an anchor point for the chain on this weird arch thing going over the top of the head, and I ran a chain through it to attach it. As I was building, a story started to emerge in my head. What if whatever relic is in this box is considered so holy that it's blasphemy to look at it directly? That's why this guy has to face away from it and open the box with a chain and let its holy light spill out. He Maybe he's afraid that he'll go all Raiders of the Lost Ark and his face will melt off. Maybe he would. As a side note, my preferred chain at this scale is 1.5 millimeter stainless steel jeweler's chain. It's very cheap, and I bought something like 5 meters of it off Amazon years ago, and have maybe used half of it at this point, and that's after an entire Black Templar's army. Finally, I have my leader, and the most complex build I did for this team. She is my sort of stand-in for Euphrates Keeler, the charismatic leader for a band of zealots. While the rest of this team is really ragtag, I want her to look a little more put together. Her clothes are less ragged, and she has a collar that would make Fonzie jealous. She started from Cleona Zeitengale. I played around at times with dry fitting on whether or not to give her a power sword from the Battle Sisters kit. Uh, in the rules, she will have a power sword. And I sent some of the pictures of the tests to my brother, who responded with, The Emperor is her sword. Well, I can't argue with that, so Ecclesiarchy symbol in the left hand it is. Now, she required a lot more heavy cutting to get the huge cowl thing from the Redemptionist to fit over the top of her torso. At the end of the day, all that really shows through is her legs, and that's fine. I chose a battle sister head with close-cropped hair to give her somewhat of a Joan of Arc look, even though that enormous collar is mostly hiding her face. I also carefully cut off the stained glass window-looking thing that was originally on the front of the collar and moved it to the back behind her head. Then, the gang was all together. At various points, I checked back to the novitiate's rules and images. I wanted to make sure that each specialist could be represented in a unique but still WYSIWYG way, and I made one plain novitiate as well to help fill out the roster. All told, I think I probably spent five or so hours kitbashing these. If you're new to the channel, I also post lore videos. If you want something to listen to while you're hobbying, there's a link to that playlist on screen now. Until next time... Burn the heretic, and thanks for watching.